All right. Welcome, everyone. Let's get started. My name is Grace Liao, and I am the Program Experience Lead here at Quantic School of Business and Technology. Behind the scenes, by the way, is our producer, Kelsey Duggan, who is working hard behind the scenes to make sure everything is smoothly. So we want to thank her for all the work she's doing to make this event happen. Now, we are here today with you, every single one of you in the audience for another episode of Quantic Conversations. And this is the first one that we're having for 2023, so we're extra excited. Now for these Quantic Conversations, if you've never attended one of these, we bring Quantic students, staff, alumni, and other community members and people who are connected to Quantic in some way onto this stage, this LinkedIn stage for an engaging, insightful conversation. So thank you all for taking time out of your morning, afternoon, and evening to join us. We know that you're all super busy, but this will be a conversation that you're not going to want to miss. So we're glad you're here. Now, today's session is 45 minutes long, and it is recorded. So if you miss any part of it, or you want to come back, or you want to share this with a friend, just come right back to the event link, and you can watch the recording after this. Now, I have to go over some housekeeping with you first before we bring our guest on. Uh, first of all, we love it when you, the audience, interact with us, and there are a couple of ways that you can do that. Now, first of all, please tell us in the comment box where you are calling in from. We love seeing how global our audience is. Two, we love our conversations to be inclusive of not just myself and the guests, but also you and the audience sitting wherever you are at home, in the car. Um, if something resonates with you when you're listening to my conversation with Terrence, feel free to comment in the box, contribute, add on to the conversation from the chat box, the comment box. And by the way, if you do have a question specifically for our guest Terrence, you're also welcome to leave it in the comment box. And if we are able to, we'll try to get to it, but no promises on that one, but we are always happy to see questions for our guests. Now, we have a special treat for all of you. We're going to kick things off with you, the audience, by playing a game. Now, we'll be putting a multiple choice question on the screen. As soon as you see it, and you'll see it right below me, type your answer, just one answer in the comment box. And those, there it is, according to Forbes, which is predicted to be the most in-demand skill for the next 10 years? Is it A, data literacy, B, digital literacy, or C, critical thinking? Go ahead and drop in the comment box your one answer. Now, for those of you who answer correctly, we will enter you into a drawing to win Terence's book, The 3D Leader, which is a playbook for leaders to win the future and thrive through chaos in a virtual automated post-COVID world. Um, all right, so now you see the question. I'll give it another 10, 15 seconds for you all to get your answer in. Is it A, B, or C? Let me take a quick peek. Ooh, lots of ooh. Okay, I'm watching you all put the answer in. Get it in there. I'm going to I'm going to count down. I'm going to count down to from ten to zero. You better. You need to squeeze it in. Ten, nine, eight, seven. Allison, I see you. <laughs> Six, five, four, three, two, and one. Oh, I see so many more going in. Okay, just a few more seconds. <laughs> I'm also looking at the names uh, names in there. Hello, everyone. Wow, so many names out there. Okay, uh, I'm going to I'm not, I'm going to share the answer now. The answer to the question is B. If you guessed correctly, we will enter your name into a drawing for Terence's book. We will DM you, direct message you by next week to let you know if your name was drawn. All right, let's move on. Hope you had fun doing that. Okay, so now I'm finally ready to bring our guest onto the screen. We are so thrilled to have him here. Terence Mary, would you join me on the screen? 
Hey, Grace. Great to see you. <laughs> Great to see you as well. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so many people out there. They are very busy trying to get that answer. In. Terrence, we're finally here. We, we made yes. it. We made it. Excellent. So uh, Terrence Mary has been described as an outspoken, wow, an influential thinker on the future of leadership by Thinkers50. He is the founder of Hack Future Lab, a think tank that helps leaders turn uncertainty into a tailwind for learning, growth, and reimagination. Terence's new publication, Building Resilient Organizations, has been co-written by with leading thinkers from around the world to help leaders sharpen their future readiness DNA in a turbulent world. Now, I am uh, especially thrilled to have Terence on screen or in, in this space with me. Uh, we met at the Athens conference, our Quantic Athens conference back in November. So it's been two months now. Yes. And uh, where Terence, you are our keynote speaker. Um, Terence's message, message to our audience and our conference attendees was uplifting, energizing, motivating, all the all the boxes that are important to tick in 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 person uh, gathering. And I I am sure that our conference attendees walked away. I remember, I remember the energy you brought. Um, Thank you so they much. left they, they left our conference incredibly energized and motivated. And so um, it really left a wonderful mm -hmm. impression on us being able to meet you in person. And Thank Terrence, you. I actually took your advice to be very bold <laughs> and then after the fact to invite you to um, chat with our larger LinkedIn virtual audience because I just thought, you know what, more people need to hear from Terrence. They need to hear him in real time or as close to face-to-face -face as possible. So I thought this would be a great chance. And so I um, I just, I, so I did much. what you said. <laughs> You're very no, welcome. Thank you so much. And I, I know, I, I'm glad you mentioned this word bold. I yeah. think uh, today's challenges can't be solved with uh, incremental thinking or yesterday's thinking. And there is a bold dividend as well, you know, stepping out of your comfort zone. So driving yourself out and your organization or, or your career out of your comfort zone is a, a multiplier of resilience. In uh, yeah. Finland, they call this Sisu, Viking spirit. We've never needed that more than ever. And that... Uh the, the Sisu one for sure was something uh, I thought, I'm like, well, if he's saying it, then I think we can all do it. And I, and it's so important to hear even the things that we know, even the things we've learned all along, it's, it is important to hear it captured at the right moments, whether it's through a conversation or it's listening to a speaker at a conference and then, um, but not just hearing it, but to act on it. And I think to, I'm yes. hoping that today's conversation I'll be asking, you know, of course, I'll be picking your brain a bit, but that all of you in the audience will won't just hear what uh, Terrence is sharing and and he and I talk about, but that it will switch something on, hopefully. So I'm going to, um, before we dive a little bit deeper, Terrence, I want to ask you, um, what is your morning routine uh, to get your day started right? What does Terrence Mary do if you have a morning routine? That's a question that I like to ask our guests to kind of get things warmed up. It's, it's a great question. And I try and, uh, you know, start each morning on the front foot. It doesn't always work that way. But, <laughs> but I think it's a really important point, though, because there is an energy crisis out there. The research mm -hmm. coming out of Hat Future Lab, a, a management think tank that I founded, mm -hmm. shows that, uh, you know, 76% of leaders are at risk of burnout. And wherever you are in your career, we're one step away from overload or overwhelm. Work intensity mm -hmm. has uh, amplified as well. In Japan, mm -hmm. there's a word called karoshi, it means death at your desk from stress. We want to avoid this at all costs. So mm -hmm. I try to go to sleep quite early, around 10, 30, 11 p.m. at the latest. Uh, try to get a good sleep, waking mm -hmm. up around 6 a.m. And mm -hmm. where possible, do some exercise. I think it's a great way to activate the mind and the heart as well, first thing in the morning. I love yeah. cycling. So when the weather is good, I like to go cycling outdoors as well. And one of my favorite destinations to go cycling is in Lake Como. So when the oh. weather permits, go cycling around the mountains. I don't, I'm not doing that every day, by the way. Um, <laughs> I wish I was. But I think it's really important to think about, um, you know, really owning your morning. So starting yeah. on that front foot with some exercise, a good, healthy breakfast, uh, yeah. and avoiding doing this first thing in the morning. It's really Ooh. difficult. 
It's really difficult. That's, Jay it's Shetty difficult. talks about this idea that would you wake up in your bedroom with 100 people? Probably not. Uh, and the idea mm. is we open this mobile straight away and start reacting mm. to everybody else's agenda. So I want everybody mm. that's listening and watching us today to mm. think about, you know, what are you doing to uh, protect your day, to protect your energy, to protect your well-being? Mm -hmm. The... Um... Thank you, thank you. I knew that we would hear some. Um, I wouldn't say secret sauce because these are these are just habits that we all need to build. But it's all, it's always insightful to hear different individuals uh, and just how they kind of construct and design that first foot in the morning. And um, the the balance sounds like it's quite key for you. A little bit of physical, a little bit of nourishment. Um, yes. I actually want to ask about Hack Future mm. Lab. What um, what motivated you to go into that venture and, and fight to start that think yeah. tank? And, uh, and what is the name, uh, where did the name come from? Yeah, so the, the sort of the framing around this is right now we should not waste one of the biggest reframing moments of our lifetime. I think the last couple of years has been an accelerant for choice and consequence. Uh, mm -hmm. An action, a call to action for everybody today is, you know, what are the bold questions you want to be remembered for this year? And the mission of Hack Future Lab is really to provide a platform for business schools, for leaders, for organizations around the world to go big, go big on laser like focus, go big mm -hmm. on strategic courage go big on value creation. Hack Future Lab mm -hmm. shares research with enterprises all around the world to give them an insight and foresight on the future before it become, becomes mainstream. And mm -hmm. so it's really about future readiness. It's about uh, you know, turning uncertainty and volatility into that tailwind for re mm -hmm. renewal or reinvention. And mm -hmm. Hack Future Lab really comes from an idea of how we hack the future. What are uh, you know, universal hacks that we can apply to our own lives, our businesses, our careers to mm -hmm. achieve a really great legacy? Because if we're mm -hmm. lucky, we get about 960 months to live. That's only 80 years of age or 29,200 days. And my goal here is not to depress everybody. It's never <laughs> been easier to waste energy, right? And to waste right. time on the wrong right. priorities, reacting to emails, reacting to digital all day long. So I want everybody to think about this sense of what does what your 960 months look like? What does your big mm. legacy look like? Are you writing your future success headlines today? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There, um, uh, wow, there, I, when I hear you and, and, and with the energy and passion that you um, express through the words, there is a sense of, uh, is there a sense of urgency? Is there, are you seeing in, in all the experiences that you've had in your career and, and leaders that you're working with, audience members that you're speaking to, is there, am I hearing this correctly? I hear like a sense of urgency. Is it, be, are we asleep? Are we, are we not getting something? Is that what's happening to the, the I guess, the world right now? Look, look at the world right out, you know, outside this. It's a very important question. And I want people to yeah. reflect on where they are. And it, there's no doubt that, you know, we've got uh, quiet quitting, for example, in China, mm. they call it Tang Ping, which means lying flat. Um, mm. According to Gallup, around 50% of the global working population, that's around 1.6 billion people ha mm -hmm. have quietly quit. Uh, and we're suffering from a major productivity paradox. We're working mm. harder and more intensively than ever, but our sense of engagement and sense of well-being is going in the wrong direction. So mm -hmm. I think there's a real opportunity to hit the reset uh, and to look at ways to scale what makes us feel more alive. That means, mm -hmm. that means agency. It means replacing fake empowerment with doing great work, not just busy work. And it means mm -hmm. knowing that what you do is making a difference. And mm -hmm. we have to fight for that. It's not going to happen by accident. We have to fight for that and make it happen in a deliberate, intentional way on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, something that I'm going to be thinking about as we continue to talk, and uh, maybe I would encourage the audience is, where do I want to start? Because even as I'm just listening and I'm thinking about my life and where do I want to reframe? What areas do I want to start with? Is it my personal? Is it my work? And they're all in inextricably connected. But um, sometimes the the overwhelm 
that we all go through is, well, where do I start? What should I start with? So maybe that's a question that I'm going to keep in the back of my mind and audience members maybe think about yes. as as we hear more from you, Terrence, and maybe you can tell us at the end too, like maybe where should we start <laughs> with all of this? Um, my beginning pleasure. To, yeah. Now I want to, I have a, um, I want to shift over a little bit to so some of the some of the fantastic content that uh, I've read through and so much wisdom. Uh, you in in one of your publications, um, I'm quoting you. I believe a change in perspective is worth 80 IQ points because current perceptions are grounded in past assumptions. Can you expand more on what you said? Look, we, um, we can get trapped in what's called the baseline fallacy. And this can happen at a, a human level or an enterprise level. The baseline fallacy is where you make this basic assumption that the future will be like the past. And maybe that was the case for, for many organizations and many industries when uh, the environment was predictable and stable, um, volatility was low, predictability was high, there were high barriers to change. But we're moving into a world of fluidity, a world of flux. And so one of the most dangerous things we can do right now is, is not question our assumptions, assumptions about mm -hmm. ourselves, assumptions about the future, future of work, for example, the future of technology, the future of chat, GPT. And so getting really people to think about their assumptions, challenging those assumptions, and also uh, challenging assumptions that have gone off like yogurt in the fridge. And so that's what it means. It's about every year really taking stock of the assumptions that you're applying in your life consciously and unconsciously, because often they're invisible, but they're, they're impacting all of our behaviors, our mindsets, our decisions, our choices, and actually challenging those to say, do these still hold true in the mirror? And as part of that, it's also about eliminating the old ways of thinking or working. For example, unlearning, for example, simplifying, for example, rejecting taken for granted expectations that you've set for yourself or you're allowing others to set for you. This is about taking an activist uh, attitude to your life and to your career and to your legacy. I call it firewalking. There's a famous poet called Charles Bukowski and he talks about, it's about how you walk through the fire. We know that volatility and predict unpredictability and uncertainty, all of these words are, are creating cognitive shock right now. But I want to reject yeah. this false constraint to say, actually, this is still the age of possibility. It's the age mm -hmm. of wonder if you're prepared to open your eyes and grab the opportunities. Mm. The, um, gosh, I would have loved to meet young Terrence as a child. What were you reading? What kind He's of very questions naughty. were you were, I was a nightmare asking? child, to be honest. Uh, I was very um, <laughs> impatient. Uh, I went through it. I, I, I was always getting into trouble. I think one, once a TV fell on top of me because I was climbing it. Um, so, yeah, my, my, I was a very, uh, I, say very di I was a chief disruptor. Uh, chief chief disruptor chief. child, actually. I think that's fair, a fair comment on myself. And my parents yeah. would agree with that. But there you is know, a, I think there's an yeah. idea of the huge power of thinking like a kid as well. When we, mm. when we become adults, because yeah. all of these, all of these kind of mindsets and risk taking yeah. behaviors and stretching ourselves out of our comfort zone, discomfort seeking skills are actually what kids do really great. And by the time they reach college, they've been educated and squeezed out of them. Sometimes we need right. to grow down and go big on it to, yeah. you know, think about resilience over fear or uh, experimenting over fixed yeah, so I think going big on the huge power of thinking like a kid, the beginner's mindset, not just uh, a mindset, is a really big deal to thrive yeah. in this world of possibility. I love that. I, I really appreciate that because I, um, uh, there is something, that, and even in what you're talking about, just all of this is that we, we need to challenge what we're, we, our old thinking, our current thinking, the stale thinking needs to be shaken up, needs to be changed. But it makes sense. We've we've turned from children to adults. And, and in that process, we've learned to stay in certain lanes. We've learned to go with the process, not question things, or it's always been done this way. And so we've forgotten what it's like to be in that more raw, uh, curious, kind of explosive state, which Yes. You know, in a lot of households was not really what parents wanted. But you know what, parents out there listening to this right now, 
I'm not saying you should let your kids, you know, do anything, <laughs> but maybe don't don't let that fire go out. I think and this I is think it. The the look, the always done ways is a comfortable place to be. But yeah. the next uh the next step of the always done ways is stagnation or mm. taking things for granted or becoming very automated, becoming bored with who you are or what you do. Um, I yeah. recently met a lady who has just celebrated a hundredth birthday. And she, is, uh, she loves to learn and she loves to unlearn. I, I think if there's a takeaway today, this is about mm. the curiosity to learn, the courage to unlearn. Uh, learning helps you evolve and unlearning helps you keep up as the world evolves. And she went to university at the age of 83. She did a master's at the age of 89. She did a parachute jump twice at the age of 100. And when I interviewed her for my new book, I said, what do you want to do when you're 101? And she replied very confidently, I want to swim with great white sharks. And this, the research backs this up. When you have a you know, purpose and energy, it's a multiplier, it's an energizer, it's a simplifier, mm. it's a clarifier, and actually mm. gives you more resilience against disease as well. So really activating, putting your purpose to, war, uh, to work is not just a nice to have. I think it's something that we have to revisit and reconnect with throughout mm. our lives. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, I, I remember um, that story when you told it at the conference and I went home, and I thought, well, I guess I still have some years left, I probably could get a few more degrees <laughs> into my system if I really <laughs> needed to. But, but, but that thinking of um, limiting ourselves and, and not seeing this, uh, I, I want to, there, you mentioned the word mirror just a, a few, a, yes. a few, a few minutes ago. And to me, that was, I've been thinking about mirrors as well. So I'm listening to you and many of us hear, you know, we read books and we hear speakers and we're like, oh yes, amen. That is so true. Everyone should do that. But I think there's a, one of the challenges is I may not see it in myself. I may see it in someone else very quickly. Oh yeah. You know, like our, our organization, they really should change that. Or I see, I, I'm thinking of so-and-so when you say, certain things, but then the challenge, the difficulty of seeing things that we ourselves probably should look at and change. How does one overcome that not seeing oneself? Where does that mirror come from if we need to have one? I think two points here. One, Nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman said, we are blind to our own blindness. So mm. you know, who's in your posse? It's um, you've got family, you've got friends, you've got your work colleagues, you've got people you work with and respect, and you've really got to create a platform where there's high, there's a sort of high psychological safety to to go big on feedback, to go big on those difficult conversations because silence is always less risky. We always prioritize silence over speak up just by default. So I think yeah. that's number one. Number two, there's a great exercise for everybody to take away today, which I call regret minimization. And mm -hmm. the idea is cast your mind to your 80, 80th birthday. Look back. It doesn't have to be 80, by the way. It could be your 40th or your 30th. You can right. choose a point that works best for you. And ask yourself, mm -hmm. think back and ask yourself, what would be the two or three biggest regrets that I would think about? What would be the two or three biggest regrets that I would have when I look back on my last 10 years or my, or my life. And actually mm -hmm. the research coming out of MIT, uh, Hat Future Lab shows that we always regret what we haven't done. And as mm -hmm. we mature, the, no, the kind of regrets start to exceed. So yeah. it's a really important point is to think about what would you regret not doing? And that's actually a truth teller. That's a way of activating your mirror to say what is important for you, what is important for you to commit to, and how does that fit into your values, uh, mm -hmm. what brings you life satisfaction, where do you want to make an impact or make a difference? So think mm -hmm. about the regrets that you would have from a career perspective or, or, or making a, a bold pivot in your life, and that's yeah. a really useful technique to think about, ah, okay, that's what I need to start thinking about and prioritizing and committing to in a really mm -hmm. deliberate and intentional way. And by the way, commitment is only the first stage. You then need to protect that. You know, have a no strategy. We're drowning in data. We're drowning in demands. We're drowning yeah. in interruptions. Unless you have a no strategy and really uh, protect your focus and get a high return on your attention, it's mm -hmm. very difficult 
difficult to stick to those commitments. So we need to mm -hmm. protect what we've committed to as well. And that means mm -hmm. pushing back, managing expectations and making sure you're creating uh, a schedule in your day where mm -hmm. you're really committing to those uh, uh, priorities that are important mm -hmm. for you and make you feel more alive. That's what this is about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the context, uh, uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, another another thing I'm observing in these conversations, we start off thinking we're going to talk about careers and jobs and roles. But what this really is about, at least from my perspective, this is about life. This is about the whole self because uh, you, we're not in containers. We don't live in, we can't silo ourselves into little departments. Now, in the context of future whatever that term means future proofing one's career would you say that risk is part of the designing the designing and paving the way for a career that is quote unquote future proof that we need to take I, I, risk no, I, I, I i think so yes um yuva harari talks about this idea that when everything is automated or augmented actually curiosity and imagination uh, are two of the most important meta skills that we need to develop and strengthen and cultivate uh, throughout our lives um, mm -hmm. for example reading fiction is a great way to activate imagination and empathy so reading fiction is a great a great resource for that. And mm -hmm. I think there's this idea that as the world accelerates, uh, mm -hmm. and we don't know exactly what, the, nobody knows what the future holds, but I think not taking a risk is a risk right now. Mm -hmm. and I also observe that most of us in our lives, including myself, overestimate the risk of trying something new yeah. and underestimate the risk of standing still. Remember, risk and reward always travel in the same elevator. You know, when I was at school and when I was at college, I was taught to prioritize certainty. And right. the problem with that is when you just prioritize certainty, you miss out on adjacent possibilities in your life. Possibilities um, are, are opportunities that could be growth opportunities for you or your family. Mm -hmm. And we miss out on those when we just have a very strong linear path. This mm -hmm. is not easy to navigate because most of us have been educated to reject uncertainty, reject right. possibility, and have right. our whole life mapped out minute by yeah. minute. But the world has changed in, a, in an immeasurable way, and it's going to continue to accelerate uh, in, mm -hmm. in terms of disruption and dislocation. And mm -hmm. so having part of you which is responsive to the unknown and can turn on the unknown into a tailwind for experimenting, for testing, mm -hmm. for uh, jumping out of your comfort zone is a great way to stay, uh, sustain vitality, but also increase the possibilities for you. Uh, thank you. That's, uh, it's, we need to hear, and I feel like we need to hear this more than once. It's not just one time <laughs> that we have to be reminded that, no, don't, don't stay that way. You need to start shifting and even, even tapping back into curiosity I think it sounds so simple. And I think a lot of these things do sound so, of course, it's almost common sense, but um, we struggle to, I, I think many of us struggle to find that first step of how do I start tapping into curiosity and breaking out of the comfort zone. So um, thank you so much for sharing that. I, there are actually a couple of questions in the box that I'd like to, uh, let me share one of them with you from the, from the audience. Um, how can one stay consistent with one's goals? Are there specific actions that a person can take? Consistency. Yeah, fantastic. I, I think, first of all, I mean, it depends on what those goals are. I think a really powerful exercise is to think about future success headlines. So future success headlines. So at the start of each year, a really great way to frame this and to bring it to life in a visceral way is to ask yourself the question, you know, what do my future success headlines look like for 2023? You know, if I was to meet you for a coffee in London or New York um, at the end of that 12 month cycle, what would be the boldest future success headline you would want to share with me? What would be those proudest milestones? Um, yeah. What would be the shifts in mindset and behavior and daily commitment that you would need to mm -hmm. activate today to start making that happen? And by doing that ex exercise, it helps you to really clarify and amplify those goals, protect them and prioritize them. And this is all about execution certainty. 
Most people have execution certainty that's less than 50%. Our goals are mm. fragmented, they yeah. are confused, and we suffer from brain fog. Right. Execution right. certainty doesn't happen by accident. It's really about laying out a roadmap of where mm. you want to be and then mm. working backwards and breaking down into those, those really tangible, operationalized mm. goals in your career mm. or in your life. So future mm. success headlines is a great technique to think about looking back. So leading yourself from the future not mm. the that's a key uh, to point to think about Most that's the key people, uh, shift yes. in mindset exactly mindset. we tend to lead uh, from the present mm -hmm. uh, and that can that can there's no danger in that necessarily or risk however yeah. in an environment in a world that's changing you know the only uh, certainty is uncertainty now actually leading from the future helps you to really think about what you wish to become. It's this perpetual state of beta, uh, mm -hmm. leading and embracing perpetual beta, forever beta world. And that mm -hmm. means lifelong learning. It means the curiosity to learn and the courage to unlearn, as I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, if we're, uh, so I'm processing what you're sharing. So if I'm going to lead from the future and a future, like future success headline as Kind of like a marker or a goal but at the simultaneously i also don't have a lot of certainty about how the world's going to operate so what is the what is the thing that will keep that futures is that future success headline something very tangible like i'm going to have this kind of job or is it a kind of way i'm going to be um I'm not sure if I'm making myself. Yes, yeah, no, I, I understand. It's, your yeah. future success headline is really your roadmap mm. for becoming the person that you want to be or uh, activating the career path that you want. And, okay. and you need to build into that um, moments of wandering, moments of agility. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is we're moving, in terms of some big macro shifts that are impacting everybody, right. we're moving from career ladders very linear, very, very conservative, very traditional, very logical right. to career climbing walls, more lateral. Um, mm. We're moving from control to, con to context over control, resilience over fear, uh, ego, uh, sorry, eco over eco, uh, eco uh, over ego. And this mm. requires uh, th that beginner's mindset, which is more open to uh, learning, more open to doing things differently, more open to rejecting the always done ways that are holding mm. us back and keeping us trapped in a box. There's a great mm. resource that I wanted to share with everybody, which yeah. is a new um, kind of newsletter and podcast by the CEO of LinkedIn, um, oh, Ryan yeah. Roslansky, and it's called yeah. The Path. And the every path. week there are really insightful interviews with people from all around the world on how they're activating their future success headlines and navigating through this world of noise and mm -hmm. demands and complexity. So the, it's called The Path, mm -hmm. Ryan Roslansky, LinkedIn. Check it out. Excellent. Excellent. We always love a recommendation <laughs> <laughs> because that's actually part of the whittling down of what we're going to focus on because we – Sometimes there are just too many choices out there. So thank you so much for the recommendation. There's another question from an audience member that I think would be great to reflect on. What advice would you give to someone trying to make a profit out of their passion? Wow. What, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. <laughs> uh, I, 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 my, my first response is be careful with passion. It sounds counterintuitive, mm. but I think we pay a passion tax. So when the, the research coming out of MIT shows that individuals, contributors with high levels of passion within the workplace uh, are at risk of burnout or overload because they love what they do. The Mayo Clinic shows, uh, has got some great research on love what you do. And it says you need to love at least 20% of what you do. Loving at least 20% of what you do in your day uh, gives you that clarity, uh, but also that resilience and that determination and perse perseverance to make mm. things happen. You're 5x more resilient, you're 4x more focused, and you're 3x more likely to turn talk into action. Mm. But there is a, another extreme. So mm. I think that's the first point here that Turning passion into profit, absolutely, but be aware of the passion tax. 
that can take its toll on our health, on our well-being, and on our on our life satisfaction. Um, number two is don't fall in love with ideas. Fall in love with problems. Fall in love with pain points. I, I met a CEO in New York recently who set up an AI platform called X.AI. And his problem, his pain point that he fell in love with was too many meetings. His research showed that one in three meetings on the planet is considered a complete waste of time. And to give a financial impact of that, for every thousand meeting, so for every thousand people who are going into a meeting that's considered a complete waste of time, that's about $15 million of lost productivity, but also a tax on human potential and future mm. potential. And so his idea was to scale an AI platform that scheduled meetings on your behalf. And that's just received over $20 million of Series A funding. So two points here, be aware of the passion tax, but also be aware of falling in love with ideas, fall in love with a problem, a, a problem, an unresolved conflict, a source of friction that your customers face. And that's where the future potential uh, ideas uh, lie, I believe. Mm. I, my hand can't write fast, fast enough right now. I'm jotting all these down, Terrence. <laughs> I love it. Okay. I have a, I have a, you've no doubt interfaced with, in, connected with hundred thousands of um, leaders, managers, individual contributors, the, the whole range. And you've consulted, you've led, you've all of that. And stepping back in your observation, is there a question that people are not asking that they should be asking as far as improving in leadership, for instance? I think questions, questions are the answer. So <laughs> okay, nice. that's, my, you know, that's my first point, yeah. new context, yeah. new challenges yeah. demand new questions. And if you stop for four minutes every day to think about new questions, that's 24 hours of new questions a year. Questions are like the golden key that can unlock yeah. the door and help you see the world differently. Also help yeah. you reject outdated ways of thinking or old assumptions that are broken. What I always say to everybody is, don't underestimate the power of questions. There's a great technique that you can apply in your own careers and with your yeah. teams or colleagues as well. Step one in your next meeting, um, pick a challenge or an issue, focus on one and commit to 15, 10 to 15 minutes of generating questions only. Avoid the rush to certainty. Avoid the rush to closure. We're hardwired as human beings to want to rush to certainty. And that is that can be a derailer. So step one, think about new questions, first of all. Step two, once you've spent 10 or 15 minutes generating new questions, as a team, pick two or three new types of questions, box-breaking questions or provocative questions, questions that push us outside of our comfort zone, questions that we haven't asked before about that challenge or problem. And then step three, the final step is to dive into those questions. I think mm. some of the big questions that we need to be thinking about in 2023 include mm. what's our no strategy at an individual level, a team level, and an organization level. Most of the organizations I go into, whether they're big or small or profit or non-for-profit, are drowning in priorities, drowning mm. in meetings, drowning in complexity, drowning mm. in the shiny new thing. Drowning in the conspiracy of approvals, drowning in yeah. a, a new committee born every day. And the research yeah. shows that only 20% of people say that decision making is a strength in their organization. Mm. I think another big blind spot and another big, another big question for everyone to think about okay. is are we overmanaged and underled? I can think of my own career. Most of us have been overmanaged and underled. I used to have a boss whose nickname was the silent assassin. And we all got our favorites. <laughs> The backstabber, the front stabber, the shadow <laughs> boss, the know-it-all, the invisible boss. Yeah. But there's research that shows that your relationship, after your friends and family, the relationship, the direct relationship with you, you have with your boss is the second biggest driver of life satisfaction. The bad news is 78% of us think that the biggest source of stress at work, wait for it, is our immediate boss. So don't underestimate these sorts mm. of questions to really think about not just work, but the quality of work and the quality of the experience mm. you're having in your life. We need to fight for this, not just take it for granted. 
I'm going to uh, ask one more question and then we'll wrap things up and, and on the topic of organizations. So, and we talked quite a bit about individual um, reflection change and, and all the things that we should start focusing on. Now, if we're, and we're, most of us in the audience are working somewhere, we're in an organization, whether we are at different levels, management, leadership, or individual contributor, uh, it's if we see it's like oh yeah this needs to change but I'm one person in the organization and this is the organization this is the environment I'm in what is something a person can do to start activating some of these positive changes because you can't overhaul an organization you can't overnight change it into something it's not yet but where could that change start to happen within an organization with individuals? I th yeah, my first answer is be the change, be the change. And so what I mean by that is everybody needs to be thinking all the time expansively about mm -hmm. learning and embracing this forever beta world. The idea that the rate of change is accelerating, but also I want to reject this idea that it's just about change. We can also focus on what we don't need to change. Um, mm. So there's a balance there. Sometimes, you yeah. know, we're tired, let's face it. Our brains are yeah. tired right now, especially after the pandemic. Now, right. a, a global recession, sticky inflation, war in Ukraine. We're suffering excess levels of anticipatory anxiety about the future. And we're drowning in BMI, not body mass index, bureaucratic oh. misery index. It's an innovation <laughs> killer. It's a change killer as well. Wow. So what I would say is, micro changes. So what I mean by that is, uh, yeah. to share an example, is testing hypotheses, mm. testing an idea, testing a hunch and in a very low cost way right. is a okay. really great way to start the conversation. Okay. So if you go to somebody and say, look, I want to change this process. Actually, okay. that is, I think it's high risk. And actually, yeah. from a sort of neuroscience perspective the, our brains are hardwired to avoid change it's high effort mm -hmm. it requires right. energy and we know yeah. the research shows that 70 to 80 percent of change initiatives don't achieve that all of their objectives mm -hmm. so you need to think about the psychology of change and i think using a hypothesis driven approach or a test driven approach to say look mm -hmm. i've got an idea I'd like to test this idea in a scientific way, I'd, yeah. you know, and, and involve people, sponsors in in the kind of criteria to judge the quality of that test or hypotheses is mm -hmm. a great way, a low pressure way, yeah. to start activating curiosity around mm -hmm. making things better. And I think mm -hmm. reframing the language as well. Yeah, as soon as we start using the word change or transformation, our backs are up, our resistance goes <laughs> up. Let's right. reframe it to learning. Yeah. Let's reframe it to unlearning. Wow. Let's reframe it to removing friction or bottlenecks or reducing BMI. It's mm -hmm. getting in the way of us doing value work on behalf of ourselves and our customers and our stakeholders. So reframe the language. Mm. Think about focus on small change rather than big change, low mm -hmm. pressure rather than high pressure and be the change, you know, model that yourself. Yeah. I love that. Um, because it can feel like, well, that's not me or that's not my role or it's not my authority, but we all absolutely have within our own sphere of control or influence, something that we can prototype or experiment with. I like to think of it as experimentation. Everything's a little bit trial and error in life anyway. Yes. And uh, I think if we just start accepting that, then maybe more things will happen. And I also believe that change change, or um, different things that look different, I think it's infectious. I think it catches on. It catches on. It, it, it does, catches right? on. And this is about, you know, go, you know, we all want to go to work and know that our work makes a difference. And I call this yeah. ROI not return on investment. We know that's important. Okay. This is not just about profit maximization. This is about human maximization. ROI, I framed as a new human metric, which is return on intelligence, return oh. on imagination, return on integrity. If you can go to work and have a high return on intelligence ratio as an individual, as a team, 
collective yeah. intelligence, get to yeah. solve problems on behalf of your customers, or get to solve problems that get in the way of you doing a great work within the business. Well, actually, you're going to feel more engaged, more energized, more resilient, and more satisfied with your life. You're going to make a difference. And so this idea of return on intelligence, getting to put your brain to work, becomes yeah. even more of an imperative when we have the rise of chat GPT, automation, yeah. algorithm, and so on. Yeah. Uh, that well, I, I love that. And that kind of, and that actually is a great way for us to kind of wind down a little bit the the whole idea of being the change and from and in multiple contexts will have huge impact and ripple effects on probably every part of our life and maybe we'll live to be a hundred also in the meantime if we start to think, I think that the, the you know coming out of the world economic forum for example united nations yeah you know, people born in the 90s for sure two out of three are going to hit a hundred minimum simply because of the advance in science. We've, you know, we're now looking at mRNA-backed uh, uh, um, uh, solutions for cancer, for example. We've gone expon we're going exponential um, mm. in terms of biotech. And so that's an exciting area to look out for. And I think this idea of a 100-year milestone is going to be very uh, feasible and, and achievable for many. Uh, and so we need to take control. We need to really start activating our future success headlines understanding that we might have a number of different careers, including some longer sabbaticals, uh, yeah. but understanding that if you can really re-energize your curiosity about yourself, inner curiosity, other curiosity and outer mm -hmm. curiosity about the world yeah. as well, you're right. gonna stand a very good chance of being able to grab opportunities and turn yeah. uncertainty into tailwinds for renewal or reimagination. Amazing. I'm going to end it there. I don't want to ruin what you just said by saying something <laughs> else. This is perfect, perfect way to end the conversation. And really, when we do these, it's really to start more conversations. It's to have our audience members think more beyond what you and I exchanged today and that it activates more questions that they're not thinking about. So audience, I, I hope that has done that for you as you listened in um, on Terrence's wisdom and just years of experience starting from the time he was a little kid and getting <laughs> to all sorts of trouble. Uh, Terrence, before we close out, what are you working on right now, this year, that's exciting and that we would love to um, know about and keep track of? Please share. Thank you so much. I think there's three big buckets. Bucket one is there's gonna be a, there's gonna be a number, a series of uh, keynotes all around the world from uh, Disney to HSBC to NASA. So really excited about that. Uh, number two is my work at MIT. So I'm at MIT uh, across April and May. And there's going to be a kind of innovation platform called Solve, where innovators, entrepreneurs can uh, pitch an idea that addresses one of the world's biggest challenges. And I did, I did so, you know, one of the winners from a few years ago was an 18-year-old uh, girl called Emma Yang, who created an app called Timeless that helps people with Alzheimer's to feel connected to their families. She's received over a million dollars worth of investment. And she's a great example of a future, a sort of courageous thinker and a courageous doer. And my final bucket, bucket number three, is a new book coming out at the end of this year called Upside. Thank you so much. Upside. It's called Upside with Wiley, New York. And it's all about really um, unlearning, activating unlearning as a leadership multiplier. You know, one of the big blind spots I think right now is adding complexity to complexity, drowning in information, mm. drowning, drowning in overload. And mm. actually unlearning old ways that no longer serve ourselves or serve the future releases energy and releases cognitive and emotional bandwidth to do new work and bold work. So un upside, unlearning the always done ways, Leadership Multiplier is going to be the new book at the end of 2023. Amazing. We will be keeping an eye out for that. Um, Thank you. It's so fun talking to you. It's just like having a really awesome meal. I just want to keep going. So, uh, <laughs> but we do have to end the call today. Terrence, I, I cannot thank you enough for joining. Um, I, our audience is, is the perfect set of ears for what you have to share. And 
as much as we think we know these things, we need to, we do need to hear a voice to shout it out to us and to remind us and like bang us on the head a little bit. I think that, I, that, yeah. yeah, I think this is it. I think, you know, the, the words of the Nobel laureate, Marie Curie, she said in life, nothing is to be feared, only understood. And the more we understand, the less we will fear. And I want people to think about that 960 months of life, 80 years of age, or a thousand months if we get to a hundred. You yeah. know, what does that legacy look for like for you? What would be the re biggest regrets you don't want to miss out on? Are you yeah. activating your future success headlines? And remember, you can't explore a new world with an old map. We cannot. And now we can go into 2023 fearless and ready for change. All right, audience, that is it. We are going to sign off here and you you know where to find us. Uh, um, Terrence, you're probably going to get a bunch of requests at this point and this kind of comes with the package. So um, thanks again and- uh, we'll Thank you so much. Time. Bye everyone. Take care everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.